Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus the Christ. I was listening to a speech given by Gary Haugen. Gary Haugen is a president and chief executive officer of the Justice Mission, IJM, some of you may have heard about it. He was originally an attorney who was sent to Rwanda in 1994 in order to recognize or in order to investigate the genocide that was occurring. In a matter of eight weeks, more than 800,000 Christians were killed in Rwanda. And so he, as a result of that experience, decided that he could no longer just be an attorney in a regular practice. He devoted and has committed his life to be there for other people who have neither known God or have known versions of God that have caused them incredible trauma, pain, and suffering. And the one, the one question that he asked, which I'd like to raise up for us today, even slightly in a different context, the question was, are Jesus and you and I interested in the same thing? Are you and Jesus interested in the same thing? Are we as a congregation interested in the same thing that Jesus is interested in? And I want to challenge us, at least in our minds, if not in actuality, sometime today to take a piece of paper and make a list of all of those things which really interest you. Make a list of all of the things where you spend your time. You may want to pick out, get your checkbook out or your credit card statement and see where it is that you've spent money because that will give you an indication of what you're really interested in. There are many people who say, for example, that they're interested in the family, but if you look at how they spend their time, they don't spend any time together at all. And so I'm asking you not just to come up with a superficial list of those things which have at times caught your interest, but those things which have grabbed you where you're spending your time, where you're spending your money, where you're spending, I'm using the word advisedly, your friendships. What would that list look like? Well, one of the things that's clear in our text is that there is a difference between being successful and being fruitful. In the text, we find that Jesus is saying, I am the vine, and then he goes on to say that we are to bear fruit. And it's different than for us to be successful. Success means that we achieve or in some way enhance a person's power, a person's possession, a person's position, a person's pleasure, a person's prestige. All of it you see when we're in a success-oriented mode. All of those things are self-oriented. And if we seek to have more power in our work, if we seek to have more possessions in our neighborhood, if we seek to have more prestige in our community, if we seek to have possessions, prestige, power, and so forth, the likelihood is that we have created a list that Jesus isn't interested in at all. And I say that a good, a good advice. Because in Scripture, again and again, especially in the New Testament, we find that Jesus is saying to the people around him, to the rich young ruler, to the man who's, who has given his life as a farmer to build bigger and better barns. Jesus is constantly saying and challenging them to recognize that their focus on success is not what he is interested in. He doesn't really care whether you score 50 points in a football game or not. He doesn't really care whether you get that position that you've been angling for, that you've been sacrificing your family for. He doesn't really care because he knows and he tells us that what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? And we find that underlying so much of what Jesus said. Now let me clarify something. Jesus is not against you being a good farmer. Jesus is not against you being a good dairy farmer. He's not against you being a good teacher or a good salesman or a good physical therapist. And we can go all the way around our congregation.
obligation. It isn't that he doesn't care about those in the sense that he thinks you should be doing something else. You may well be doing those things. What he cares about is that we get so caught up in those individual items in our lives that center around power position and possessions and prestige and pleasure that we don't recognize what is really important in our lives, which is to follow Jesus and allow him to save us out of our sin. So that Jesus makes a distinction between being successful and being fruitful. Being fruitful, as Paul tells us so specifically, is so is to have the Holy Spirit work in us in a way that we have love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness, and gentleness, and faithfulness, and goodness, and then of all those things, self-control. That's the basis of being fruitful. That's what it means to be fruitful and productive. That's where it starts in our hearts, in our very being, and then it exudes out into our neighborhood, into our congregations, into our families, into our lives. And so it's important, and Jesus again and again underlines that what he's really looking for is for us to be fruitful. But how do we become fruitful? But well, that's again where the text comes in. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Let's stop for a moment. David Jeremiah was a pastor of Shadow Mountain Community Church in California. He's a wonderful preacher. On one occasion, he said that you and I approach God in a way that sometimes doesn't recognize reality. And here's what he meant, and here's the illustration that he used. Let's assume for a moment that you have a doctor's appointment, and all of us have had doctor's appointment. Let's assume that we go into the doctor, and the doctor is there, sitting there with us, and the nurse is standing by him, and, and he says, you know, I've taken your blood pressure, Mr. Scherner, he said, and it's 120 over 70, it's really great, I think you've done it. Great job, your cholesterol is great. I mean, you don't have anything, anything to worry about. Your bad cholesterol, your good cholesterol, nothing to worry about. In fact, he said you're healthy. You did the, the stress test, you passed it with flying colors. You're really doing okay. And you walk out of that office and you say, Wow, that's really good. All those rabbit salads that I ate are paying off. And so you walk away, and as you walk away, the nurse approaches the doctor and says, Doctor, he said, all those things that you said were okay were in fact okay. He said, but you didn't tell him. You didn't tell Mr. Sherman that he has cancer. Why? And the doctor says, well, I didn't want to ruin his day. Would you accept that answer? Would you accept an answer from a doctor that he didn't tell you what was wrong with you because he didn't want to ruin your day? None of us would accept that. And yet that's how we deal with God so often. We don't want him to point out to us the problems that we're having. We want him to stick with the good things in our lives and don't worry and don't you bother me with your sinfulness, with my sinfulness. if we have no sin. When in reality, you and I and all of us here know that we are sinful and we need pruning. And that's the first thing that we have to recognize. We need pruning. We either need to be cut completely away because we're dead wood or we need to be pruned, cut back so that we can actually thrive. So the first way for us to be fruitful is to recognize that God is interested in pruning us because of our sinfulness and even because of our virtues. We need to be cut back so that we can be truly fruitful. Not successful, but truly fruitful. And then he goes on, and here is really the focus. Here is really the center. If you take nothing away from this sermon, then what I'm going to say now Please recognize that the focus in this text is not just on pruning us and cutting us back and cutting us off, but the text really focuses on what? 
that we abide in him. On seven different occasions in these eight verses, Jesus talks about abiding, remaining in, being so connected that we are receiving our life power, that we're receiving the power from Christ rather than relying on ourselves. I've shared with you, I think, and at least in one of the Bible studies, that when after the war my father told me that the Russian Cossacks were some of the fiercest fighters. Some of the fiercest fighters. And they would come in and they, you know, they fought against tanks with lances and you know, medieval kind of weapons, and yet they were incredibly successful. But they were really backward in one important way. They never had seen any modern conveniences. And so often they would go into homes and they would turn on the light and the light would go on and they'd take the switch of the lamp and go back to their tents and put the switch on and the light fixture in the tent and turn it on and nothing would happen. Why? Because they were disengaged from the power source. You see, you and I are invited by our Lord to be engaged, connected to the power source, to Him, to abide in Him. Because only then can our light shine brightly. I have this. You know what this is? What is this? Anybody tell me what, what I have here? Power strip, right? What can you do with a power strip? Well, you could plug in and I, almost, I was almost going to do it and then I thought it was a little dorky, so I'm not going to do it. Stick in the lamp and stick in various things here into this power switch and then show that you need to have a connection. But let me show you something else. Let's assume that you have this power strip. You say to yourself, hey, I know how this works. And you plug it into yourself. How many of you would say, that's rather stupid, surely? The laughter tells me that at least a few people over here <laughs> catching on. It is stupid, isn't it? It's ridiculous for us to think that we can take a power strip and plug it into itself and then make the things work. But if you think that's stupid, then why is it that we keep on living our lives as if the power were within ourselves? We have so many secular voices telling us that go into yourself, focus in on yourself, centers yourself upon yourself, and you will find resources and powers that you never thought you had. It's ridiculous to think that we could plug ourselves into ourselves just as it is ridiculous to think that that's what a power strip. We need Jesus. We need to abide in Him. We need to remain in Him. We need to recognize that a source of our power will come from Him. And then we're told we will be fruitful. Then, and only then, according to our Lord, will we be fruitful. And if we're honest with ourselves, we know that. But for some reason, we are so dece we deceive ourselves so much into thinking that we really can live our lives without Him. So let me go back. Let me go back to the original question that Gary Haugen asked. Are you and Jesus interested in the same thing? Take a serious look. Or are you so concerned about being successful that you can leave Jesus standing where he is with his list that doesn't match your list? Make that list. See how it first corresponds to what is written in Scripture. 